Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from Acts chapter 1, and I'm going to be reading verses 8 through 14. Jesus has risen from the grave, and He's meeting with His disciples, and, and this is what He says. He says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be My witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And after He had said these things, He was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud receiving him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was departing, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. And they also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. And they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, that is, Peter and John and James, Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. And all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. Pray with me. Lord, breathe, breathe on us that we might know your spirit, that we might allow you to live your spirit through us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Little girl went to her mom and said, Mom, where did the human race come from? Her mom said, well, God created Adam and Eve, and then they had children, and then they had children, and so on and so on. She said, oh, okay. A couple of days later, she was with her father, and she said, Dad, where did the human race come from? And he said, well, a long, long, long time ago, there were the monkeys, and people developed and evolved from, from the monkeys. So she went back to her mom. She said, Mom, I'm confused. You said the human race came from Adam and Eve, that God created Adam and Eve, and, and Dad said monkeys. Her mom said, that's simple. That's not a problem at all. I was talking about my side of the family and your father was talking about his side of the family. Well, sometimes there's confusion, a lot of confusion. Whenever we start with theory, whenever we start with hunches, whenever we start with well, what we think, the early church did not start with theory. The early church did not start with hunches. The early church didn't start with, well, where this is what we think. It started with witnesses. It started with, with one fact, that the same people who walked with Jesus while He was here on this earth, who watched Him do the things that only God can do, the same people that saw Him crucified on the cross, dead and buried, were the same people that saw the risen Christ. They spoke with Him. They ate with Him. They talked to Him. They even... The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that there were even 500 people at one time. 
that the risen Christ met with. We have story after story of, of, of him meeting with different groups. But 500 at one time, we know that he met with Cleopas and another disciple as they walked along the Emmaus Road. We know that the risen Christ met Paul on the Damascus Road. And that story is three times here in, in the, the book of Acts. And here we have a time where Jesus is meeting with his disciples. And he's met with them to tell them to wait. To wait in the city until he comes and they're clothed with the Holy Spirit, power from on high. Well, they go back and it, it lists their names. And it's 11 of the 12 disciples. By this time, Judas had hung himself after the crucifixion. And these are the names. These are the names that the witness starts not just when they start talking. The witness of these people starts when it lists their names. And this is what it says in verse 13. Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew. That's a great witness right there, Matthew. This book was written probably between 60 and 72 AD is what, what scholars believe. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And Matthew is listed here among the disciples. Matthew, a tax collector who collaborated with the same government who destroyed the temple. Matthew, who Jesus called from a tax office in his hometown, that as he was leaving, he said, follow me, and Matthew followed him. We tend to think people who work in a tax office must have applied for the job. That's not the case. Matthew, a tax collector, bid for the job. The job went to the highest bidder. He paid in order to get that job. And all that the Roman government cared about was that he collect the, the taxes that they required. Anything that he got over and above those taxes that they required, he got to keep. So tax collectors were rich. Not a little bit rich, very rich. They had the power behind the, of, of, of the Roman government of the Roman army behind them in order to collect their taxes. Now, once an occupational government has destroyed your town, collapsed your government, and is occupying your city, no one says no to the Romans. Matthew had collaborated with the Romans in order to collect taxes. And here he is, listed among the disciples of Jesus Christ. But that's not all. It goes on, and after Matthew, it says, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot. That's the second name that I want to start. Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were also known as the Sakari, or the dagger carriers. They were assassins. They made a pledge to assassinate collaborators like Matthew. So here, among the disciples, we have a collaborator and an assassin who's pledged his life to kill, to kill people like Matthew. That Matthew and Simon were witnesses. Matthew and Simon were witnesses. And in the very next verse, verse 14, it says, these all were with one mind. Well, I do have a hunch. They weren't of one mind about their politics. I do have a theory that they didn't sit around and talk about the virtues of the Roman government and how they build such great roads. And what about Pax Romana? They were able to keep a peace like no other, no other empire had been able to. No, they weren't sitting around. I have a theory, and it's just a theory. They weren't sitting around talking about those things. They weren't sitting around talking about, well, what really would have happened if the zealots had, had gotten big enough and had killed enough of these tax collectors. They weren't sitting around talking about politics. They weren't sitting around talking about politi of, of partisanship. They weren't of one mind about those things. They were of one mind about one thing, and that one thing was the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. That changed all of history, and it certainly changed their world, and it's changed our world today. Matthew and Simon were witnesses, 
and they were of one mind in prayer. But Acts doesn't stop at that point. Acts chapter 4, verse 32, this is what it says. And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. That they were of one mind, one heart, and one soul. It, It takes two steps beyond just being of one mind. That Matthew and Simon were witnesses. And they were of one mind, one heart, and one soul. So what are, were they of one mind and one heart and one soul about? What did they witness to? What were the facts they witnessed to? And that's what it says in verse 33. And with great power, the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning. That Matthew and Simon were witnesses. And the first thing they were witnesses to is what it says right here. The power of the resurrection. There were witnesses to the power of the resurrection. Bobby Ross, before he was coach of the national championship team from Georgia Tech, he was a specialty coach for the Kansas City Chiefs. Well, being a special teams coach meant that he practiced a lot with the kickers, the punter and the kicker. Well, the kicker at the time was a a fellow named Jan Stenerud, and he would spend long hours helping Jan Stenerud how to place his his kicks, not just through the uprights, but on the kickoffs. And very often when he was kicking them from the uprights and and different hash marks, that he he needed some ball boys to go on the other side of the fence to shag the balls and bring them back so Jan Stenerud could keep kicking and, and Bobby Ross could continue coaching. Well, one day, you looked around, the ball boys weren't there, but there were two fellows that were kind of shabby looking, and they would often come and sit in the bleachers and watch Jan kick his field goals. And um, he asked the fellows, he said, um, do y'all mind shagging a few balls as, as Jan boots them through the uprights and over the fence? They said, no, that'd be fine. Well, Jan Stenerud kicked a, a few more, and then he turned to Bobby Ross, and he said, coach, in this thick Swedish accent, he said, do you know who one of those guys was? And Bobby Ross said, no, I didn't know either one of them. He said, one of those guys was George Brett. (laughs) Well, George Brett is one of the greatest baseball players who ever lived. He played for Kansas City and the Kansas City Royals. And uh, he was he was shagging balls, and that's when Bobby Ross said, you know, that may be the most expensive ball sh- boy in history. Well, it may be the most expensive ball boy in history, but I've got a story that tops that. The God of this universe put on flesh and blood, and Jesus Christ came to this earth for you and for me. And He walked. He walked with disciples. He ate with disciples. He fed the multitudes. He gave healing to sick bodies. He died on a cross for you and for me, and He rose from the grave. Not so He could sit in heaven and watch us from a distance and maybe whisper a word or two. He rose from the grave so He could pour out His Spirit in ordinary, everyday folks like you and me, that He could live His life through us, that He could give us power over sin, power, the kind of power that that the world has never seen before, Uh, enough power to raise a, a body from the dead, enough power that it wipes away sin once and for all, enough power, the power of His Holy Spirit to live in you and me to give us strength, in weakness, enough power to give us love, even in the midst of bitterness, and to give us light in the dark times. Matthew and Simon were witnesses to this power, a collaborator and an assassin. Now, if ever there's a time that this world needs witness to the power of the risen Christ, Now is that time. 
And I believe you're just the witness. You're just the witness. Matthew and Simon were witnesses, and you know what? You can be too. They were witnesses to the power of the resurrection. But the second thing that I wanted to talk about this morning, they were also witnesses that Jesus is Lord. This is what it says in verse 33. It says, And with great power the apostles were giving witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Peter's first sermon, it says exactly that, but a little bit more succinctly. It said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made Him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, that Jesus is Lord. Well, we don't use that kind of talk nowadays because we don't have lords. But what it means is Jesus is king. Jesus is first. Jesus is preeminent and there's not a close second that all of our lives are oriented around Him. That Jesus didn't come just to change history. He came to change individuals. Lives like yours and mine. It was just about a a hundred years ago, 110 years ago, I graduated from seminary. And I was sent out to serve a church that was kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And um, I had been there about two weeks, and one of my members said that there was a fellow in the church that was in the hospital. He had cancer, and it looked like he, he didn't have long to live. Well, I went to the hospital, and sure enough, he, he couldn't respond at all. Um, and the nurse said that his family was at the end of the hall, that it was his wife, his sister, and his son. Well, I stepped out into the hall and looked down the hall, and uh, there were two women and a man down there. The, the man looked like he was probably late 30s, early 40s. Well, I just graduated from seminary. Uh, somebody in their late 30s, he looked you know, old, one foot in the the grave and the other on a banana peel. And a, but he didn't just look old. He looked mean. Just seeing him down the hall. He had a beard down to about right here. And he had a, a Harley Davidson t-shirt on, Harley belt buckle, cigarette rolled up in his sleeves. Back when you could smoke in the hospital, but I don't think he much cared. And he was, he was smoking and just looked like he could bite a head off in a heartbeat. Well, when I walked up, I introduced myself. And immediately one of the women said, Oh, preacher, won't you pray for us? And that's when he looked at me and he said, Young fellow, I don't want to hear a word you got to say. And that's when the, one of the women said, Oh, Gary, you don't mean that. Preacher, pray with us. And my immediate prayer was, Lord, help me not get the stuff and beat out of me. Um, but I started to pray. And then during the prayer, Gary got up and he walked away. Well, I stayed there with the two women for a while and and uh, then I went to go find Gary. Gary was in another part of the hospital. And um, when I walked up from a distance, he said, young fella, it's nothing against you. I just don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear anything you got to say. And I said, that's okay. I'm, I'm not here to talk. I'm here to listen. Well, I sat down, but not real close. And he didn't talk immediately. But then when he began to talk, he said, my father said, he's the toughest man I ever knew. There's not anything that he couldn't beat. There's not anything he couldn't overcome. And now this cancer's got him. Well, he's right. He was right. His, his dad was tough. His dad hung on a lot longer than anybody thought he could. He lasted about two more weeks before he died. And during those two weeks, I would go back to the hospital and I would sit with Gary. And Gary began to tell stories. These stories weren't like stories that I'd ever heard. There were stories about motorcycle gangs he'd been in, about people that he'd shot, people that he pistol whipped. I didn't know what pistol whipped was. It was just where you get a gun in your hand and you smack somebody with it. He told stories about being paid to beat up somebody at a bar, somebody he didn't know. Somebody get him some money and say, go beat up the guy at the end of the bar, and he'd go beat him up. He wasn't bragging. These were the only stories he had that every story had Something like that happened in it. Well, after the funeral, I didn't hear or see Gary for a long time. And it's probably about eight or nine months later that I got a call about eight o'clock one night. It was Gary, and he didn't sound the same. And he said, can you come by my trailer? I said, sure. Now, 
I lived in the middle of nowhere and he lived about 10 miles past the middle of nowhere. And drove up, I, I knocked on his trailer door and um, he opened the door and he didn't look the same, he didn't sound the same. He was, he was obviously in pain, he was holding the side and he said, come on in. And I said, are you okay? He said, no, I'm not. He said, my best friend was shot and killed in the bar last night. He said, my father, he's gone. He said, I've tried to quit drinking liquor for the first time since I was 15 years old. He said, look at my hand. His hand was just shaking like that. He said, my gut's on fire, and I don't know what to do. I said, I don't know what to do either. But I know that Jesus Christ does. Well, that night, Yuri and I prayed that he received Jesus as Lord, the one that he, he oriented his life around. The one that's, that's the leader, that's the king of his life. That he had been leading his life long enough. When we finished praying, Gary said, do you feel it? I said, yes, I do. He said, no, Jesus is real. That he's not just this idea. He, he's real. I said, yes, I know. I said, that's, that's his Holy Spirit. He said, I could have told anybody and they'd never believe it, that Jesus is real. Well, that was an amazing thing that night. But what happened in the coming weeks and months and years was even more amazing. Gary would come by my house fairly often. It was probably about a week or two later, he came by and he said, I quit my job. I said, well, why'd you do that? He said, everybody there took drugs and I couldn't stay off drugs if I stayed on that job. So. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I don't know. I'll find something. Well, he didn't seem to be concerned. There was a peace about him. No job, no prospect, but there was a peace about him. And then it was about two weeks, three weeks after that, he came by. We'd, we'd read the Bible off and pray. Most of the time, just talk about what was going on and, in our lives. And, and he said, I got a job. I said, what's that? He said, I decided to, I'd go apply at the jail. And he said, I, I think there are people that could use my help there. And I know what, some of what they're going through. Well, he didn't just go and work at the jail. That he began to be a witness of what Jesus had done in his life. Now, he wasn't a, an in-your-face, bang-your-head-with-a-Bible kind of witness. It was that when he saw need... He witnessed what Jesus had done in his life. Fast forward a couple of years. A member in my church had asked that I go visit someone they knew that had been arrested, that they were in jail. I'd visited this woman three or four times through that thick plexiglass that they had there at the jail. She would never make eye contact, and usually it was like she didn't have anything to say. She really, she, she just wanted a break from from sitting in her jail cell. But this day was different. This day she sat down and she looked at me directly in the eye. And she began to share like she had in the other, other visits. And then she said something that knocked me off my feet. She said, do you know a fellow named Gary that works here? I said, yeah, I do. She said, he told me about Jesus. And that's made all the difference. Jesus as Lord of our lives is what makes all the difference. Not a tack on, not an add on, not a theory, not an idea, not some, some good information about somebody who did some really good deeds a long time ago. This is Jesus as Lord, the risen Christ that we orient our lives around. That Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. Matthew and Simon were witnesses to Jesus Christ, the hope of the world. A collaborator and an assassin were witnesses that Jesus is the hope of the world. We're living in a time right now, a time where voices out there are telling us that Donald Trump is the hope of the world. They're telling us that Joe Biden is the hope of the world. They're telling us, no, the Republicans or the Democrats are the hope of the world. There'll be nothing but contention and lies and disappointment 
I don't know how this election is going to come out on Tuesday, but I do know, and I am witness to one thing, that Donald Trump and Joe Biden are not the hope of the world. There's not a political party that's the hope of the world. Jesus Christ is. And there's a world that needs that witness, that the collaborator and the assassin can be of one mind, one heart, and one soul. And if they can be of one mind and one heart and one soul, the church has a great witness that we can too. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. Not when He's an idea or a theory, but when He's Lord, Lord of our lives. Matthew and Simon, they were witnesses. And I believe you can be that witness too. They were witnesses of the power of the resurrection. They were witnesses that Jesus is Lord. And the third thing that it says right here in verse 33, chapter 4, verse 33, with great power to the apostles were given witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and abundant grace was upon them all. They were witnesses to abundant grace. In his book, Proof, Timothy Paul Jones tells a story about the adoption of his middle daughter that uh, she had been in the foster care system for a while. As a matter of fact, at one point, she was adopted by another family, but this family didn't treat her like one of the family. As a matter of fact, the first family that adopted her, they went on a trip to Disney World and they took the biological children, but they didn't bring this little girl, their adopted daughter. Well, when they got back from Disney World, it wasn't long after that, that they, they put their adopted daughter back into the foster care system. Well, that's when Timothy Paul Jones and his family chose to adopt this little girl. And one of the things that realized that early on that this little girl, she had outbursts. She was having contr- trouble controlling herself. And, and he thought, well, Maybe if they they went to Disney World as a family, she would see herself as a part of the family. But when he announced to to the children that they were going to Disney World, it made her behavior even worse, that she began to steal food. She began to lie. She began to treat the rest of the family cruelly, as if to guarantee that there was no way that they would allow her to go to Disney World, that she would guarantee that she wouldn't be included as a part of the family. Well, the time came that they went to Disney World. And they rode all the rides. They stood in all the lines. They ate all the food until they were totally exhausted. And at the end of the day, he turned to his adopted daughter and he said, how did you like today? And this is what she said. She said, Daddy, I finally got to go to Disney World. But it wasn't because I was good. It was because I'm yours. That is grace. That Jesus gave His life on the cross for you and for me. Not because we're good as we could be. Not even because we're better than we had been. Or not because we're the best we can be. He gave His life on the cross for you and for me because we're His. That His love for you. That He gave His life for you and for me out of a a love for us. Not because of anything that we had done. That on the cross, when He gave His life, it wiped away all of our sins, all the sins of the past, all the sins of the present, and all the sins that we would ever commit. There's life. There's life knowing that the the power of the risen Christ can take away your sins and mine. And it's, it's to that that Matthew and Simon were witnesses. The abundant grace, not just enough grace, but an abundant grace, a grace that not only forgives our sins, but spills over where we can show that grace to others. There's an election on Tuesday. And after that election, there are going to be a lot of wounded people There's going to be a lot of grief 
and there's going to be a lot of folks responding to their pain and to their grief. Matthew and Simon, they knew what abundant grace was. And with that abundant grace, they reached out to a world that needed to know it. And I believe that you and I were called to be just that kind of witness. The church. The church that reaches out in grace. In grace to a world that's hurting. Grace to a world that's grieving. Because that's the abundant grace that Jesus gave you and me through the cross and His resurrection. It may be that you've never received that grace, that forgiveness that was offered on the cross, and, and that abundant grace, that that's something beyond your understanding. Well, this morning I want to let you know it's not just a hunch. It's not just a theory that I have. It's, a, it's not even just a belief. It's something that, that you can experience this day. And I want to invite you to pray with me. Jesus, it's your abundant grace that changed the world a long time ago. And it's still changing this world today. There are folks that, that may have never experienced that abundant grace. And, and some of those folks may be listening to my voice right now. Well, I know my voice isn't that important, but your voice is. God, I am grace enough, grace enough to, to hear your voice this morning, to hear those words, your sins have been forgiven. To know the freedom that comes from hearing that word. And Lord, I ask that you grant grace enough, strength enough, power enough that that grace be given given to others as well because there's a world that's hurting right here at our doorsteps. And Lord, may we be the church, your witnesses. And if Matthew and Simon can be witnesses, we can too. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're a church that's a place of community and faith, and we're a welcoming church. I hope that you experience that online, but not only online. My hope is that you experience it through our Facebook page. But not only that, once we meet together in person, we're at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, and I hope you'll come and experience it in person. We're a welcoming church. We're a biblical church. And we're a compassionate church. It's a place of community and faith where we help people live a Christ-centered life. And my hope is that you'll come and be a part of it. Thank you for joining us.